स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया for the n variable case right so let us look at an example of this special case scenario okay so the example involves motion of a free particle okay so to describe the motion of a free particle let us define the coordinate vector of the particle so q bar which is which is q1 of t q2 of t q3 of t right which is the which we say that this is the cartesian coordinate the cartesian coordinate of a free particle particle of mass m right at at time t cartesian coordinate of a free particle of mass m at time t so then in that case the motion is going to be described using uh, the sum of its kinetic energy and the potential energy right so so in that case the kinetic energy the kinetic energy of the particle let me define describe it using this abbreviation k dot e Uh, is defined by the function t of q q bar q bar dot which is nothing but half m v square or half m q1 dot square plus q2 dot square plus q3 dot square so this is mass times the square of velocity or the kinetic energy finally the potential energy the potential the potential energy denoted by the abbreviation pe we define it to be we define it to be uh, negative of v of t comma q right let, let well let's to begin with let us say it 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 is described with a positive sign right so and and of course this potential energy is a scalar function it's a scalar function of of a vector right uh, because this is an energy so it must be a scalar function and also uh, the, well scalar functions and also it it can describe the forces the force is described by the gradient of this potential with respect to this coordinate vector so this is standard newtonian mechanics the gradient of the potential with respect to the position gives us the net force on the particle right so so let us continue then we describe so this is the kinetic potential we also now describe the so called lagrangian right so what is lagrangian so lagrangian is the functional in calculus of variation language lagrangian is a functional uh, f- well it's a f- it's a function it's basically the integrand of the functional it's a function which is defined by described by l of t comma q bar comma q bar uh, dot which is also equal to t of q bar comma q bar dot minus v of t comma q bar right so we see that Uh, so the lagrangian is this following quantity when we substitute the values of t and v we see see that this is also equal to half m q1 dot square plus q2 dot square plus q3 dot square minus v of t comma q bar okay now what is uh, well this in this particular example we will see that the euler lagrange equation reduces to the conservation of energy that is 
uh, that is the, 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 the beautiful result in this example. So, let us look at the Euler Lagrange equation, but before that let me introduce a new concept. So, let us now digress. So, there is a brief digress from our original discussion. Let me now introduce the so called Hamilton's principle, right? Hamilton's principle, right? So, what is Hamilton's principle? Hamilton's principle is nothing but that it is just the physics language of the variational calculus, right? So, let me write down uh, a little bit of trivia about Hamilton's principle. It turns out that Hamilton's principle is also also known as known as the principle of least action, principle of least action, the principle of least action, right. All these words will become very clear as we move along uh, the, uh, our, our course discussion, ok. So, uh, another fact is that when we find the extremals this uh, for these example and other similar physical examples, not necessarily the extremals will be either maxima or minima. The extremals could very well be saddle points, right. We are going to describe and distinguish between the different types of extrema later on when we describe the sufficient condition for the extrema, right. So, what I just said is that finding extremal does not guarantee us to find max or min. So, extrema could also be could also be saddle or saddle point right not just not just minima right. And uh, Hamilton's principle is sometimes more advantageous than just looking at plain Euler Lagrange because it is more general it is more general it is more general than Euler Lagrange equations because first of all it is applicable because it is applicable applicable for multiple coordinates multiple coordinate system right. So, functions of several variables dependent variables and it is also uh, more often than not applicable for different coordinates. So, in particular it is also applicable for non Cartesian non Cartesian coordinates right. So, that is some of the advantage of using Hamilton's principle. Now, coming back. So, what is Hamilton's principle? Hamilton's principle says that. So, Hamil Hamilton's principle says that the that the path the path of the motion the path of the motion of the particle the particle from let us say q bar of t naught to q bar of t 1 the path of the motion of the particle from q bar of t naught to q bar of t 1 is such that q bar is an extremal q bar is an extremal of the form j of q bar is equal to the integral from t 0 to t 1 l of t comma q bar comma q bar dot d t right. So, the path of the motion of the particle from point a to point b is such that q bar is an extremal of this this particular integral also known as the action integral right. So, the Hamilton's principle is nothing but the Euler Lagrange equation stated in the terms in the words of physics right. So, so, uh, so essentially uh, uh, this is the Euler Lagrange equation ok. So, so moving on uh, so we are going to let us go back to the previous slide. So, we are going to to find the to find the extremum for the motion of the free particle we are going to use Hamilton's principle and find the least action or the 
the extremum of the action integral right so what essentially we are doing is we are we are solving the euler lagrange equations when we are applying hamilton's principle essentially we are solving euler lagrange equations for the n variable case so when we do that we have the following set of equations right and this is for k 1 to n now let us now plug in the value of l right so notice that l is half m summation q k dot square plus well not plus but minus of v of t comma q bar right the y minus because uh, as we increase the coordinate of the particle physically it is assumed that the potential energy decreases so it has an inverse relation so l is the lagrangian and when we plug we see that uh, in this first partial q k dot only appears in the first term that is the kinetic energy so this after plugging in the value of l we get that this is also equal to m times q k double dot minus the second quantity which is the partial l partial q k only appears in v so i get that this is also equal to uh, this is also equal to uh, this is also equal to uh, del v del q k for each component right so so what we have is what we have is well it becomes a plus because we have a minus here right so this is equal to 0 or i have that m q k double dot is equal to minus del v del q k and, and pe people who have done basic newtonian mechanics we see that the derivative of v with respect to q or the gradient of v with respect to q gives us the force force on each component gives us the force on each component right so essentially i am saying that and and this particular quantity on the left hand side is nothing but the acceleration of the kth component now i am sure students can easily recognize that this equation is nothing but newton's second law that is mass times acceleration is equal to the net force on each component okay so we we have essentially written newton's second law while solving the Euler Lagrange equation. Okay, so then, so the phys the physics follows beautifully in this case. So suppose now we can look at a special case where our potential is independent of t. Notice that t only appears. The independent variable t only appears in v. So suppose if the potential also is independent of t, then my my Lagrangian will be completely dependent on q bar dot and q it is independent of the independent variable t and then we could directly use the Beltrami identity to reduce our Euler Lagrange. So what I just said is the following. So suppose, so further suppose I have that v of t comma q bar is equal to v of q bar right which is a potential independent of t. potential independent of t right and we see that in this case l my lagrangian will also be independent of t so l is independent of t right so in this case my euler lagrange reduces to the beltrami identity so my beltrami identity becomes uh, becomes h which is equal to summation q k dot del l del q k dot minus l is equal to a constant right where this summation is from 1 to n okay so we just plug in the values of the of this function l and while we do that we see that 
my Beltrami identity h of cube bar q bar dot reduces to reduces to half m q1 uh, q1 dot square plus q2 dot square this is a 3d space system uh, for one particle plus v of q bar and of course this is equal to constant via the condition of the beltrami identity notice that the beltrami identity has very beautifully resulted into the conservation of energy so this statement is nothing but the conservation of energy which says that the sum of the kinetic plus the potential energy is constant or conserved okay so let us uh, look at a related example let us look at an example of a not really a freely moving particle but a particle performing a certain motion so i call this example as example 2a or uh, namely i'm going to look at the motion of a simple pendulum so let's say i have a blob of mass m let's say this is the blob of mass m and it is hanging by a rope of length l the rope has almost zero mass right and the blob is under the influence of the gravity and further the coordinates of the blob are x of t comma y of t right so so i want to x of t comma y of t so this is my coordinate of the blob so we see that in this case the motion of the simple pendulum uh, in this case my kinetic energy so we need to write all the different forms of energy the kinetic energy in this case will be half m v square so half m x dot square plus y dot square because these are the two different components in 2d we are talking in 2d and notice that x1 square plus y1 square is nothing but if this is my l and this is my phi of t so this is nothing but the total area of the arc that is swept uh, well this is nothing but uh, this is nothing but in terms of l and phi this go, this is going to be l phi dot uh, uh, dot t whole square right so uh, yeah so so that is the case here right uh, so how did we get that well we are assuming very small oscillations right well how did we get that let me just briefly mention that so if if my phi is very small i'm if i represent x and y by its polar coordinates i see that x is l sin phi y is l cos phi and for phi small sin phi becomes phi and cos phi becomes 1 and when we plug it in this expression we get that this is also equal to l square phi dot square right okay so this is for small angle of oscillation okay so then my potential energy my potential energy of the problem my potential energy of the problem becomes v is equal to mgh notice that h will be this h will be this this quantity minus the total quantity which is l so this is also equal to m g l minus this quantity this is l cos phi so this is l minus l cos phi so this is how much the ball is above the ground or this is also equal to mg l 1 minus cos phi right okay moving on so what we have is the following you see that now we have written both the kinetic and the potential energy so now i can write down my action integral my action integral f of phi is given by the following 
integral from t 0 to t 1 of the total kinetic energy minus the total potential energy. I am just writing the Lagrangian from my previous slide. Right? So, this is phi times times d t. Okay? So, then we see that here this is L of phi comma phi dot. So, there is no explicit appearance of t in this Lagrangian. So, I can very well use Beltrami identity and my Beltrami identity, my Beltrami identity says that using Beltrami identity, using Beltrami identity I see that I get half m l square phi dot square plus m g l 1 minus cos phi. So, that is my Beltrami identity which is the sum of the kinetic energy plus the potential energy will be a constant or the conservation of energy. Right? So, the so what it says is now that the extremal phi is going to satisfy this conservation of energy. So, the next step involves trying to remove the constants as much as possible. So, we divide throughout by m l square by 2 and we get the following expression that we have phi dot square plus plus uh, plus we have uh, a g 2 g by l 2 g by l 1 minus cos phi is equal to let us say a constant c naught, but again 2 g by l is another constant. So, that can also be absorbed on the right hand side. So, we get that phi dot square minus 2 g by l cos phi is equal to another constant c 1. Right? So, now uh, to solve this, this particular equation, uh, we first differentiate this equation with respect to our parameter our independent variable t. We see that after we differentiate, let me call this as, as star, we differentiate star with respect to t, we see that the following uh, solution exists. So, we have this minus 2 g by l sin phi times times uh, well times. So, we have a cos phi with a minus will give me plus sin phi and times phi dot is equal to 0. right? So, phi dot appears in both quantities. So, it is taken out common and further we assume we assume that phi dot is not 0. right? Otherwise, we are going to get a trivial solution phi is, is a constant and that is something we are not after. So, which means that from here we get that the solution reduces to the following equation 2 g by l sin phi which is equal to 0. right? So, then the next step is since phi the oscillation angle is small. So, since, since phi is very very close to 0 small oscillation angle, we can reduce the equation further by saying that sin phi is equal to phi itself and then in this case the equation reduces to phi double dot plus the constant times phi is equal to 0 and this the solution to this equation will be a linear combination of sin and cos of uh, a constant. So, I can write down this, this solution phi of t is let us say in terms of a constant sin of square root g by l times t plus uh, plus phi naught. So, it is a solution with, with two unknowns a and phi naught and these two unknowns are determined by the boundary conditions okay? and, and that is where uh, we can stop our discussion on this example. Okay? So, next we look at another example, we look at another example namely the, the brachistochrone in 3D. Right?
brachistochrone in 3D. Okay. So, so again, what is the problem? The problem again is to find the optimal curve in 3D now, so that a bead sliding without friction reaches at the bottom of the curve in the minimum possible time. But this time the curve is in 3D, right? So the problem is find find the point the points or the curve of fastest descent fastest descent between the points x0, y0, z0 and x1, y1, z1, where, where my z is the height, is the height of the curve and, and, uh, and I have two dependent variables y, z, they are functions they are functions of of x they are functions of x okay so so what i have is the following so we see that to figure out the solution to the brachistochrone in 3d uh, we again write down the time functional so our time functional is t of y comma z so, these are my two dependent variable comes out to be 1 by square root 2 g. Again, using the same argument that we did for bra brachistochrone, we, we uh, spoke for brach brachistochrone in 2 d. We get that this is equal to the total arc length 1 plus y prime square plus z prime square d x divided by divided by square root of z naught minus z. Right? Then, well, of course, now we have two variables, two independent, sorry, two dependent variables and both are dependent on x. So, which means that we are going to have two sets of two Euler-Lagrange equation, one for y, one for z. So, which means we have the following system of equations to solve. So, the first system is for y, we have, we see that this integrand is only a function of y prime, right. So, which means that our Euler-Lagrange equation is simple, relatively simple, which is of this form y prime divided by square root of 1 plus y prime square plus z prime square, square root of z naught minus z, right? This is set equal to 0. This is the Euler-Lagrange with respect to the variable y. The second is the Euler-Lagrange with respect to the variable z and we see that the equation reduces to the following form. Reduces to the following form minus 1 plus y prime square plus z prime square divided by 2 times z naught minus z to the power 3 by 2, this is equal to 0. So, this is my Euler-Lagrange with respect to the variable z. So, then we can start solving each of the equations 1 and 2. So, from 1 I can directly integrate 1. I see that I get a solution y prime divided by 1 plus y prime square plus z prime square uh, is equal to c 1 times square root of z naught minus z, right, where c 1 is a constant of integration with respect to x. And let me call this as 1 prime and then uh, if we are to solve 2 prime, notice that 2 prime is a mess and it is not going to be easy to solve 2 prime, right. But, but uh, let me call this integral as 1, but we note that uh, that 1 is also independent of x. So, we can definitely use Beltrami identity for two variables, right. So, what I wrote, what I just said is the following, right. Solving, 
solving the second equation. Solving this equation is a mess. Solving equation 2 is difficult. It is difficult, but we have to note that 1 the original integral is independent is independent of the variable x. The original integral is independent of the variable x. <coughs> and so, in this case we can write the Beltrami, we can use the Beltrami identity. Okay. So, in this case we have the identity with respect to two variables y y prime z z prime. This turns out to be the following form minus f is equal to c 2. <laughs> right? So, now we can directly substitute our small f that is the integrand. We see the following. We see that this is also equal to square root of 1 plus y prime square plus z prime square divided by square root of z naught minus z minus y prime square divided by I am just I have just plugged in the expression for small f or the integrand of the functional. We get the following expression a huge expression which we eventually simplify this is also equal to the constant c 2. So, when we simplify after taking the necessary LCM and common denominator, the simplified version reduces to the following form 1 by square root of 1 plus y prime square plus z prime square. This is also equal to c 2 times square root of z naught minus z. So, let me call this particular relation as 2 prime. So, we have two sets of equation, two new sets of equations to solve. One is given by this 1 prime and the other is given by 2 prime. So, for the variables y and for the variable z. So, what we can do immediately we can we can divide 1 prime by 2 prime. So, we can divide 1 prime by 2 prime to see that y prime is equal to c 1 by c 2 right or I get that y of x is equal to the quantity c 1 by c 2 times x minus x 1 plus y 1. So, we get for the, the variable y we again get the equation of a straight line. However, it does not contain any z which means z can take any value from minus infinity to infinity. Uh, so, what I am trying to say here is that this new equation is not the equation of a straight line because there is the variable z as well. So, this is an equation of a plane, equation of a plane parallel to the z axis, right. It could contain z axis, but not necessarily. So, this is vertical or parallel to the z axis, right. And then the further the further solution can be found by solving 2 prime and we will see that the further solution will be a cycloid. This equation is nothing but the equation for a cycloid. So, so which means combining this solution which is in the box with the motion of the cycloid we, we conclude that the brachistochrone in 3D leads to an extremal which is a cycloid in a plane parallel to the z axis. right? So, so what I said is the following. So, further 2 prime, 2 prime gives the relation between y and z which is which is going to be once we solve is going to be a cycloid. And so, the conclusion the following conclusion can be drawn. The following conclusion can be drawn that the solution to 
the 3 D brachistochrone brachistochrone the solution to the 3 D brachistochrone can be reduced can be reduced to the solution solution to the brachist to the 2 D brachistochrone uh, in a in a vertical plane right in a vertical plane or a plane parallel to the z axis okay so that is what we have 